Hello and welcome to Small Biz Central, the show where we exchange information and ideas about small business. I'm Tim Brunero. On this episode of Small Biz Central, we are going to be talking about young people in business. And of course, we're joined by our panel of experts. Don Wright with the University of Western Sydney. Welcome, Don. G'day, Tim. Uh, Dory Kadahi, the poster boy for this year's BRW Young Rich List, co-founder of merchandising and marketing company DKM Blue, and author of a new book, Power to Act. Hello and welcome, Dory. How are you, Tim? And of course, let's not forget Matt Bowen, director of Chasing Rainbows Australia. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Tim. Okay, let's meet our first young person in business. Hi, my name is Sasha. I'm 20 years old. I was originally born in the Republic of Georgia and now I live in Australia after travelling the world a bit. I'm an entrepreneur and I started a brand named Sasha's with which I want to make the world a better place. My idea for the Sasha's brand name and in, in making the world a better place so it came inherently f from, I, I guess, a younger age. I always, I always looked at the world and I always saw that, uh, I thought that, we, uh, that it was only fair that everybody lived in equality and that everybody was empowered and educated to be able to live the, live the kind of life that they, that they had the potential to live. And I remember there was an economics lesson where we watched a video uh, which, which sort of outlined the injustices of the world where people were living and, and working in these very poor conditions. And by that time, my dream started solidifying that I really wanted to live in a world where there was no poverty and people had the resources and the tools so that they too would be able to follow their dreams. And by that time, I realized that business and economics were fundamental foundations of the world. And with business, we could fundamentally give back to the world. Because if it wasn't for the community, the society and the people and the environment, businesses wouldn't be where they are today. And so I decided what better way then for a business to give back to the world. And that's how I came up with the idea of the Sasha's brand name, which I will grow into an international company. And no matter what we will sell under the brand name, 50% of the profits will go into the foundation. So two years ago, on the 10th of June 2008, I started writing my book, Teens Big Dreams. And after two years of edits, I designed the book this year and published it in August. Lots of people that are reading it around the world are already being inspired by it. And what's incredible for me is while I intended for it to originally be read, like for teenagers, that's who I wrote it for, the book has been read from children as young as 10 through to uh, teenagers and pa parents and adults and grandparents. The way that the Sasha's 50-50 business model works is pretty simple. If the businesses are here because of the community, society, the people and the environment, it became the business's responsibility to also give back to the world. So what I decided to do was come up with the Sasha's 50-50 business model, which meant that no matter what product or service that you would buy under the Sasha's brand name, 50% of the profits would go straight into the foundation. And in the foundation, 100% of the funds would go to provide the resources and the tools for other people in the world to become self-sustainable. And so what I really wanted to do was have a foundation where all the, admin, all the administration costs would be covered by the company. So every person knows that when they're buying a product from the Sasha's brand name, they're already making a true difference. The other 50% that doesn't go into the foundation goes back into growing the Sasha's brand name because that is the only way that we will be able to grow sustainably. And the way I envision the brand to work is that the, the more exponentially the brand will grow, the more exponentially the amount of profits would go into the foundation to help other people. The kind of marketing that I use with Sasha's is it's not so much about pushing onto consumers or pushing onto people. Instead what I want to do is I want to create a, a sense of excitement among people and a sense that they would want to become part of the brand name. And so something that I do is I, I try not to give a lot of news out and instead what I try to do is I try to create this excitement about something that, which, that might be coming. Uh, at the moment, I'm currently working full-time on my book, Teens Big Dreams, I'm promoting that and also working full-time in growing the Sasha's brand name. I have been working uh, since the age of 15 and uh, for nearly, uh, nearly every single weekend since then. So I've used all my savings and I've used all the money I had in order to bring the Sasha's brand name and the book, Teens Big Dreams, to life. Wow, Sasha really, really is a very, very fast talker. Don, he's got his book and he's got his brand. What are your first impressions? It looks great. I think it's really commendable. You know, he's, as you say, he's got such energy and enthusiasm and I think it's fantastic. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about his business and I think it's great that he's, he's growing this brand and he's got this commitment to, to charity. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I suppose I'd like a little bit more meat on the bones to understand exactly how he's going to make that brand work in terms of selling products or services in the future. Hmm. Now Matt, you actually work with young people, of course you're 
um, in the community with your foundation, helping young volunteers work with other young people. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, yeah, I'm the director of Chasing Rainbows Australia. So unlike Sasha, this is a 100% not-for-profit organisation. And the objective is to basically put young people uh, from university uh, education into uh, small communities to uh, volunteer, basically, it's volunteering programs with disadvantaged children. Um, so we're working closely with the Sudanese community around the Greater Western Sydney region because we found that uh, a lot of the families are migrating to Australia and the kids are going to school but they're not quite up to the educational standards of their classmates. Mm. So uh, we're bringing in some predominantly university educated students to come along build those kids up to a uh, standard of their classmates and yeah, we're finding some great results so far. Dory, so much of, um, so much of <laughs> Sasha's model is giving back yeah. and I know that in your business um, there was a time where you took someone under your wing, yep. um, I think their name might be Cosima DeVito, I think we all know <laughs> who that is, um, but, but to you that was uh, sort of some giving back because you didn't have a lot of experience in the music industry, I think in yeah. your book you say I had you know all the experience I had I could have put on a postage Personal, stamp, yeah. everything I knew, um, but and even though that might not have, that was kind of a revenue neutral thing, that was something you wanted to do for her? No, definitely. I think it's important to give back to the community, whether it's to an individual or to a charity or to a foundation. So I think um, what Sasha's done is great, and, and I commend him on that as well. Um, you know, at 20, you know, I didn't think I didn't think I even had the headspace to even think of that. I was running around, I was running around clubs and uh, enjoying my my teen years. So um, I give him a lot of credit for um, you know for starting. So I think Sasha's on the right on the right track, and I think he's he's got a lot of, a long way to go. But I think he's He's got the um, the right idea and direction, and and yeah, and, you know, what I've done with Cosmo, it's it's given me um, I'm giving back to her in, re in relation to trying to help her out with uh, with her career, and it's it's all about helping and, and, and put back, I guess, what you get out. And of course, it has dividends for you because you get to network and meet a whole lot of people and learn, I suppose. Yeah. But you're a very young person focused as well. Yeah. Um, you hire a lot of young staff, and you sort of have a bit of a catch cry again yeah. in in your book. Um, that you'd rather build experience than buy, buy it. Yeah. What, is, what does that mean? Well, you know, any upstart business, when I, I started my business eight years ago, so I think the most important aspect of any business when you start is manage your cash flow and manage your overheads. And for me, you know, I measure business on what you make, not what you turn over. And the most important thing that I really focused on was, you know, as Sasha was saying with his business, I wanted to focus on my brand and focus on my business and, and get the model right. And Yes, you can hire senior staff and you can pay them big dollars, but that costs money. And if you have cash flow there at the start, then you can put a strain. So I had the philosophy, I prefer to hire young staff and teach them my philosophies, my, my understanding of the business and, and let them project what I wanted, what I, how I want them to project uh, my business. So it is, does take more time and more work, but the rewards are there at the end. And it's funny, I think you mentioned in the book that you um, use a combination of sort of monetary rewards, um, positive reinforcement, yeah. and even the odd day off to to encourage staff who have performed. Okay, now uh, we haven't had the last of Sasha. He's got a question for you guys. My question to the panel is: What do you think of the business model, and what do you think I can do in order to to grow that business model uh, into the future? Well, Sasha is one of many Australian entrepreneurs. We've got Dory here, um, yeah. Dick Smith, Colette Dinigan, yeah. uh, John Simons. I mean, what is it about Aussies that we seem to, to just sort of push these entrepreneurial boundaries? I, I think Aussies are resourceful people, you know, they, have, they get an opportunity and they seize it and they run with it, which I think is a, is a really good thing and it's great to see young people in business doing that and I think that's what they need to do. That's, um, that, you know, that, that is the ingredient to take you forward is that energy and enthusiasm and, and the grabbing an opportunity when it comes. It's funny, we want to give Sasha as much advice as we can. I know, Dory, you talk about, again, in your book, um, about uh, how important it is to compete for awards and that it can pay dividends on a whole range of levels? Yeah, it's, it's definitely like, you know, awards, you know, it sells itself. You know, if you, if you can become a finalist in an award or you can win an award, it's always, it's free marketing. People are selling your, your business for you. So, um, you know, with my business, I focus on entering as, my, as many awards as we could and, you know, we haven't won any. But we've been in the top five and top three, and and been finalists, you know, uh, in numerous um, areas and categories. So it's always it sells your business for you. And I think it, it, it puts a little bit more trust in the consumer, knowing that you know you've been recognised by an industry body or or, or, an, or an industry magazine as being one of the best out there. And that's important.
Matt, uh, you work with Gen Y people. In fact, I think you actually are Gen Y. Yeah. Everyone says they're selfish, they want it all now, uh, they've got Peter Pan syndrome, they don't want to grow up. What do you say to that? Look, I mean, I have to disagree, Tim, because I am Gen Y, but um, people would be after me if I said otherwise. Look, sure, we are fickle, and it's all about our Facebook friends and how many followers we've got on Twitter, but there, are, there is the so exception. So nice to hear you admit it. <laughs> <laughs> There's the exception, like Sasha, you know, he's got energy, he's got enthusiasm, and he's got a great business model, you know. I don't think that uh, growing your business and having a, a foundation on the side is mutually exclusive. You know, that's a great idea. If they both grow together, then not only is the community getting more, Sasha's getting more in the back pocket too, which is going to uh, boost his energy and enthusiasm about growing the business. Um, my advice to Sasha would be probably just a little bit more transparency in the foundation because uh, consumers will flock to a good idea. Um, and at the moment, Sasha doesn't really stand for anything in terms of the foundation. He says he wants to give all the money back, but you know, we need to know where it's going. And I'm sure we'll see that, you know, Sasha will, um, he's got that brand and as he says, he's, he's ready to go with a whole lot of these product ideas and perhaps like you, Dory, I mean, you know, you were so full of enthusiasm when you went on your famous trip to Europe and you were sort of thinking, I want to I wanna make some money, I want to succeed and mix with some of the people you were mixing with, but you hadn't had your idea and I think you put your flight off back home from six England six times, times yeah, until yeah. you got those famous three bits of paper that had the bones of your yeah. um, business plan, which was to become, you know, DK in blue. Yes, definitely. Um, you know. Um, I think the most important thing is getting the right foundation in place and I think Sasha's got the right foundation, the mechanics are there, um, but I think he should focus a little bit more on promoting the foundation and what the foundation stands for and I think that's once he gets that, that right, um, I don't think he should focus a lot on promoting how this, the mechanics works. I think once people say uh, it's, a, it's money's going towards the charity, I think people will tend to trust that. I agree and with that. Yeah. I think he, we understand the fact that he's, he's giving money to charity and that's great, but I think as he moves forward and he wants to access finance from financiers and, mm. and, and sell these products that he's going to promote through the Sasha's brand, there's going to have to be a little bit more meat on the bones of the business structure. People are going to need to understand how this actually works. And it's great that he's going to create excitement around the brand. I think that'll work. But I would like to understand a little bit more about his business model and how he's going to actually mm. generate revenue. Clearly he's ready to make mistakes, Dory. I mean, you must have made a million since you started. Tell us about some of those, the growing pains. What mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, you know, it's, I'm a firm believer, uh, for me, before I even started my business, I was always visualising all the negatives in the business. Um, so when people say to me, what mistakes have you, have you made? I, I would say I haven't made any massive mistakes. It's always been calculated mistakes. They're experiences. That experiences. Um, and it's important. I always like to learn about other people's mistakes than my own. Um, and before I even started my company, I spent six months on my European trip and just visualising all the negatives that can go wrong in a business. And once I subconsciously worked that out in my head, when I came back and I had those hurdles, I subconsciously had, had, had gone through those. So um, you're going to always make mistakes, but make it calculated where it's not going to cost your business or your house or, or anything. Don't put, don't put it on the line. Well, I don't want to cut Dory off. He's going to be back with uh, lots more tips after the break. Welcome back. Now we're going to meet another young person in business. Hello, my name's Katie Knight and I'm the owner and managing director of a business called Respect. Um, we are a boutique recruitment agency specialising in digital media and we're four years old. Before Respect, I um, did work in recruitment and uh, prior to that in media, but I never really throughout school and university had a concrete idea of what profession I wanted to go into. What I did know was that I was ambitious, I was highly competitive, um, I loved people and loved knowing about what made them tick. And to me, success was not working hard and making money for, for somebody else, it was doing it for yourself. Um, and that was really a goal for me very early on. Working for a recruitment agency before I started Respect, I was only 26 years old and really felt digital media was a big growth sector. Um, it wasn't being tapped into at the time. Um, and secondly, and most importantly, felt that there was 
a need for a recruitment agency that was acting as a professional service um, that cared and respected candidates' careers and um, their experience, um, had high integrity working with the client and uh, acted as a trusted advisor. And thirdly, to create an environment a chance for, for staff to be um, to learn, develop, to work as a team and, and overall be respected. We discovered very early on that the people that were most successful in our business were had come from a consultative background and also come from a media background themselves. So they could go out to a client, have a clever conversation um, about their business and also about the roles they were filling because uh, they'd all come from the environment themselves. We had a great year one. We hired our first member of staff. We moved from the front lounge room of my business partner's uh, apartment to a new office. Uh, we managed to pay back our investor um, with interest in uh, a matter of six to eight months and we had a, an annual turnover of half a million. Year two was a little bit different. Um, we decided to expand nationally into Melbourne and the month before the GFC hit um, and despite working hard and uh, trying our best, um, Melbourne made a huge loss and my business partner's health really, really suffered and unfortunately um, passed away early this year. From then on, um, on the back of a GFC, I've uh, managed to turn the business round. We're now in the black, we're now making profit. We've, I've streamlined all of our internal processes. We've hired a new, um, new staff. We've moved into a new office. And throughout all this time, I've been pregnant, um, which has had its own challenges. Um, so we're in a good place. And I really feel that if you work hard, you keep going um, and you keep learning, then you can be successful in anything you do. Well, Katie's got a fantastic business now, and I want to know, Don, when are we going to get a dog for the Small Biz Central office? Absolutely. <laughs> we can sit right there. Perfect. <laughs> so what are your impressions? Oh, look, I think that's a great-looking company. Um, I like the fact that she's gone after a niche market. You know, she had experience in digital media, so she focused her business on that area, and uh, it looks like that's really worked for her. And I like the fact that she's hiring people who have experience in that industry as well. So, as she said, they can go out and have an intelligent yeah. conversation with the client. And she also treats her candidates very well. You know, she looks at both sides, the candidate and her mm. customer. So, yeah, I'm really impressed with that business. Such amazing communication skills and clearly she talked about how she hired staff with media experience. I know that uh, Dory, um, you always talk about um, good communication with um, suppliers, with customers yeah. and that kind of follow up being its own yeah. advertising. Well yeah, I guess it's important that you have, that you, you treat your clients and your customers as partners um, and, I, and I really enjoyed watching that because I saw a lot of sim similarities with her business to my business. Um, you know, I started at 26. Um, and you know she ventured off to Melbourne, which which what I which what I had done as well. Um, but you know she she worked in the industry prior to that. She found a niche market. She saw what the industry wasn't doing, and focused on doing something the opposite to it. And I think if you find your niche, um, you will grow. And that's something that I focus on my business. So I think she's on the right track. Matt, we always think about marketing as being kind of these big highfalutin promotions and stuff. I know that you've got a lot of marketing experience. Can it come down to those? baseline communication skills? It can. You know, if you can't sell your business, uh, you're really going to struggle to get any traction in the marketplace. Um, what I've seen in Katie's business is she's someone that is very resilient, you know. It's a moving story. We've got pregnancy, we've got the loss of a business partner, mm. and we've got a small, a small business which comes with, you know, many, many challenges. But despite all that, Katie is moving forward and she's got a strong intention. She can communicate that well through her stakeholders and she's moving forward. It's a great story. You can't really fault her, can you, Don, because, yeah. I mean, you can... In terms of a risk management strategy, how can you foresee the month after you? Yeah, look, I mean, that, those things happen, you know, but the, the, the fact that she was able to get through it, you know, there was enough strength in her core business in Sydney that she could take the loss of Melbourne and move on. And so I'd clearly get... that's proof that it was a calculated risk because she knew that the core business could carry well, it. That's right, yeah, but I'm sure she would have learned more out of that experience than most things in the past, you know, five or ten years. So. Yeah, that, as I say, it's good experience moving forward. I know in your experience in the aerospace industry, you always talk about how when you're hurting, you also know that the competition's hurting. It's like a marathon race. Sure, it's your guts are burning, but yeah. everyone else's is too, and it, there's opportunities there. Well, that's right. I mean, a, a downturn like we experienced with the GFC can be an opportunity as much yeah. as anything else. And if you can keep your business in good shape so that when tough times do come, yeah. you know, it can be an opportunity to move forward.
Stole my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say it happens that, so, yeah. in, in small biz central and in and in the business world. Uh, so Dory, I mean, I know that um, you, you've had lots of the Sydney Kings. I think you were when you were twelve. You were one of the towel boys down yeah, there, yeah. and you obviously played representative basketball yeah. around the world. And then you came back, and one of your dreams is to be an owner of the Sydney Kings. Yeah. But of course, we know that they've had some problems in the last couple of years. How do you? I mean, how do you deal with that? Uh, well, for me, you know, when I came back, um, when I was in a fortunate position that I had the funds there to sort of invest into my into my team that was uh, prior to the collapse of the Kings but you know it's um it was uh, it was a, a dream for me to sort of get involved with it and you know I knew how much money I wanted to lose with that so it wasn't a business decision to make money but I looked at avenues of how I can market my business within the sporting arena and I, I did do that entertain clients courtside um, had my corporate branding on the side of the, of the court and yet enjoyed enjoy the sport so if you are going to take risks as you were saying earlier on Tim take calculated risks and know how much you want to lose with that and then you'll find that you'll be safe. And I suppose it didn't hurt to be sitting up there in that corporate box either. <laughs> um, okay so we've got a question from Katie. So my question is um, how do you think a business can bulletproof themselves against an economic recession? Now this is a, a tough question. Uh, we know that Katie was so smart in the sense that she opened the Melbourne office and obviously she was smart enough mm. that, that she survived. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think something that businesses can do that, that is a good strategy in this type of situation is try to look beyond just your customer and look forward to what is the derived demand, the derived source of demand. And in her case it's the digital media industry. So if you can be monitoring that industry and, uh, and be aware if there's any downturns coming, if there's been a, a retraction of some funding for the industry or they know that there's, there's some kind of um, reduction in demand coming, that gives you an insight into what will be happening maybe six, 12 months down the track. So mm -hmm. a, an event like the GFC, you know, who could predict that? Um, but certainly there are strategies you can employ to help you manage through those, those situations. Dory, you've talked about how in bad times you kind of uh, work to forge alliances with uh, customers and distributors and sort of yep. work on some that fundamental stuff? Yeah, uh, it's I guess it's always important having partnerships in place and you know we've always treated our clients as partners in the business um, and I guess any any you know any downtime you're going to get within a within a business or within a, within the economy as Donald was saying it is hard to predict but I, I always reassess and I always stress out that if you have the cash flow and you build a tight run business you can overcome these tough times and um, this is a time where you can take advantage of, 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 the, um, of the GFC or, 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 or a downtime. And this is where a lot of companies, the smart ones, who run a tight ship and a smart ship in the good times, are the ones that can take advantage in the bad times and possibly at times double the business. Our, our business grew by 30% in the downtime mm. because we had the ability to be able to spend more money and market the business further and be more aggressive instead of being reactive or being proactive in, in, in that tough time. That's, you use that key word. I know that your business is based around branding. I mean, and marketing. I mean, that's yeah. what you do. You you make those sort of corporate uh, corporate wear, the caps, yeah. the jackets, um, the, the the USBs, the cups for particular yeah. companies. But I think, Matt, it's interesting because branding and marketing obviously extends beyond Dory's business. Um, and, and it can be such a useful tool um, in business in general. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, branding is more than just a logo. It's the whole brand feel. It's the experience of, of your business. Um, so for Katie, uh, in the downtime, she can take an opportunity to actually invest in herself and invest in the business. So get a strategic plans right and actually plan for the good times. Mm. I mean, a lot of the time, Dora, you'd know that when yep. you're having a successful time, sometimes the, the business can run off the rails a little bit because yep. you're just thriving in success and you don't really need to think too hard to make money. But uh, she should see these downtimes as an opportunity, Tim, to actually think about the business and how I can move forward in the next 12 months um, and really get that ship straightened again. Mm. It is hard staying grounded uh, when the money's rolling through and you, everything's running like clockworks. And that's the difference uh, in business. It's the ones that stay focused and keeping their feet on the ground um, that, have, that, that can roll through these, these bad times. I mean, one thing that research shows that during tough times, people that, that pair things back and focus on their core business, it really gives them an advantage to try and get through it because they can respond quicker and they can be more flexible. They're not worrying about all these peripheral activities around their business. So that's just one tip. During tough times, maybe pull it back and just focus on the core activities. I know, Dory, that you um, focus so much on making, uh, drawing lessons from related businesses and you always say you're not just competing against the uh, people in your industry but also those producing 
alternative products. And you yeah. sort of said you run your branding agency a lot like an ad agency. Yeah, definitely. Like you know, it's you know finding the core, the core, uh, the core business of what you do. Um, our, our industry was sort of at the bottom end of the um, of the food chain, so, um, a, a, as you say. A lot of the agencies were really focusing on the on the big dollars and the big marketing and, and focusing on above the line media. And our industry was below the line media, below the line marketing, mm. and, and that was sort of the the little brother, you know, last minute, you know, we'll slap some logo onto a product and get out, get the leftover budgets. But one thing I tried to focus with in my industry, I saw the way industry was being perceived is to change the way the way the industry gets perceived. So for me, it was more about focusing on changing people's perception on merchandise. And eight years down the track, um, we have found that the consumers have been a lot more a lot more aware that they can get a lot more bang for the buck by, by being clever with the way they spend it. It's funny, having visited uh, your company, I know that, say, um, Mercedes-Benz had you doing some merchandising for them, but they never saw it as something they could actually make money from, that their brand was so strong that people would actually pay for that cap or that Definitely. jacket. And that's where you've actually thought outside the square to, I, to bring yeah, more value. I think it's important. You know, you, you've got to educate your clients. You know. Um, you know, they're good at selling cars. You know, some clients are good at selling computers. Um, merchandise and marketing is like their key, mm. their, their key business. So our aim is not just to sell the product. Our, for me, the product was always a secondary component of, of the business. Our first aim was to educate our client and tell them the, the, where they can go with it and what they can do with the brand. And, and once they started getting that, we found that you know, clients weren't too worried about saving five cents here or five cents there. It was more about we want to protect our brand and we want our brand to grow further because any time you put your product onto a brand, it's going to be in the marketplace for years to come. Okay, guys, well, we could talk, talk all day, but unfortunately... Hey, Tim. <laughs> I've got a little surprise for you. Um, <laughs> as we saw throughout the series, um, Tim was out on location shooting all those pieces with the businesses. And we thought we'd just have a little look back at a few of the lighter moments. Black one or brown? He had a lot of fun and he did mind a few freebies along the way as well. <laughs> there was the netball skirt, there was the funny hat and lots of chips and chocolates and things like that. But that wasn't all. There was one more, which was Tim's favourite, a kangaroo scrotum <laughs> he got from the Ugg Boot Company. So Tim, there you go. Thank you Your very little much. little souvenir from the series. Yeah, no, no I'm, I'm, I'll be able to give this to my dad, I'm sure, at Christmas time. <laughs> Well, thanks so much to our panel and all our panels and all the businesses that have featured on Small Biz Central. And of course to you, Don, who's been our perennial panellist. <laughs> and of course, thank you to all the businesses that have joined us throughout the series. We've got a fantastic website, www.smallbizcentral.com.au with some fantastic resources. Um, and of course, a big thank you to our viewers that have joined us throughout the series. It's goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.